so all of that effort, the scheme really only ran for a year. And then the Second World War started and it all terminated. So, yeah, it was a bit disappointing. <laughs> they put all that work in and, and really never got that far. But... Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bell. Welcome to part two of what was going to be a two-part discussion with the fantastic Phil Fabre about the Empire Flying Boats in Qantas service. But we got a bit carried away with this one. So this is now part two of three. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're going deep on flying boats. And again, we're staying in the Pacific and around Australia for this conversation, because in today's episode with the fabulous Phil Vabre, who is the president of the Civil Aviation Historical Society in Australia and runs the Airways Museum in Essendon, we're going to be looking at what happens when war breaks out, what the competition is going on for the flying boats in the Far East. There's some interesting things there. KLM, the Japanese Airways flying south. There's a lot to go through, which is why this episode's got broken up into two. So we're going to kick this one off straight away and dive in to see what happens to the Qantas C-Class boats and the Imperial Airways and soon to be BOAC Airways flying boats as well. So Qantas and Imperial were not the only outfits flying this sort of route. We mentioned briefly KLM last time operating it with uh, Douglas Aircraft. What was their routing were they doing that same sort of almost curve down the bottom towards um the dutch holdings in in, in southeast asia what was what was the competition up to yeah well that's also a pretty important part of the story and um, i'm only going to really talk about the uh, the eastern service uh, mm -hmm. for the flying boats although of course the african service was a big part and there were also other Developments going on in, on the Atlantic with Pan Am as the uh, the opposition there, and so on. But for our purposes, we're just going to talk about the Eastern Service. So the Dutch had pretty extensive colonies in the Far East in those days: the Netherlands, East Indies, which is Indonesia today, and uh, they likewise were keen to connect. Uh, the Netherlands with their colonies out in the east. So they were early, uh, pushed out an air service uh, quite early on. And they, for a long time, had their eye on coming down to Australia. I guess they could see a, a commercial market for that. And as early as 1931, uh, KLM operated a proving flight out to Australia. But the uh, British and Australian governments really didn't want the Dutch competing uh, for you know, reasons of imperial prestige and economic reasons and so on. Uh, and also because there was no intention at that stage of pushing the British service out to Australia. So that didn't start till 1934. So uh, three, well, yeah, three years later, more than three years later. So... Um, the problem was that when we did start up the international service, and remember Cornus was doing the bit to Singapore, which passed had to pass through the Netherlands East Indies. Um, the airplanes had to refuel en route uh, back in those days because they weren't that long range. Um, we needed to get rights to pass through the Netherlands East Indies. Um, and, of course, the Dutch used that as leverage for their own air service because they needed rights to fly through... British parts of the, the globe. Um, and there, as I said, there I was on Australia for quite a long time, but um, the British government managed to stave that off for a little while. But by 1938, when the Empire Flying Boats uh, started up, um, one of the problems was not only did they have to build flying boat bases in Australia for the Empire flying boats, but they also had to get the Dutch to do the same thing in the Netherlands East Indies. And the Dutch had uh, military flying boats operating in the, the East Indies at that time, but they didn't have any civil flying boat service and they certainly didn't have any intention of starting one. So any flying boat bases they built for civil operations would be purely for the, uh, the British service, the Imperial Airways and Qantas service. So the Dutch were able to then 
leverage that to get an agreement to uh, for air services to come out to Australia. So at about the same time as the Empire, uh, and in fact, the, the British and Australian governments refused to, to allow them to start until the um, Empire flying boats came online and we were able to start our own service. But once that had started, the Dutch got permission to come out to Australia as well, and they ran a service out to um, Sydney as well. So their service was KLM, mostly using DC-3s uh, from Amsterdam to uh, Batavia, which was the capital of the Netherlands East Indies. And then there was another airline, uh, KNILM, uh, which was the Dutch Netherlands East Indies airline, which was an internal airline for the, the East Indies, and they were the ones that operated the Batavia to Sydney part of that route, so similar to the Imperial Airways Qantas uh, set up. And they were using Lockheed 14s out to Australia. So that was the, the situation uh, in 1938. We had two international airlines operating out to Australia and basically in competition. Um, one of the interesting things was you had Imperial Airways with these Empire flying boats from a, from a passenger point of view I'm talking about. Um, they had spacious cabins and beautiful reclining chairs and stewards with meal services and so on. And the KLM, KN ILM service was a bit quicker. It was about half a day on the whole trip, um, but in a much more cramped sort of environment, much more akin to a modern airline travel, in fact, than, than or, you know, for economy people, <laughs> uh, than uh, the, the Imperial Airways Service. So it's an interesting contrast. And, of course, the other problem for the Dutch was that the British authorities wouldn't allow them to pick up any mail in Australia either. So they could bring mail in, uh, but they couldn't uh, take mail out, whereas Imperial Airways and Qantas had a, a monopoly on the outbound mail. So we, we're getting into that. I'm having flashbacks to try to remember what all my freedoms of the air are and, and, and things like that. So it's burgeoning days of the, the different the different freedoms, different rights. Um, but then also you, you've got much smaller aircraft operating the route at the time. If you're saying the, was it the 14s, the Super Electra, the slightly souped up um, version of that, which I, I do like an Electra. Um, so that's uh, what became the Hudson Bomber, of course, during the war. Yes, of, of course, yeah. It's such a lovely aircraft. I think one just started flying here again. Um, uh, Sydney Cotton's one, he says. Is that right? Yeah. Um, as we segue, he, he clicks, because I think I just, did I just see that? Yeah, a 12, uh, 12A electric junior. Okay, yeah, not a fourteen. Hmm. No, no, but, but, but anyway, it was. We digress. Um, so how this is a silly question. It's probably not the one to ask. How, how does the competition affect the view of of Qantas and Imperial? Because you know we they've, they've the stipulation there is not being able to carry returning mail. So there, you know, there's more mail coming to Australia, which is a good thing. Which means there'll be more mail to carry back. Um. Does that change any of the way that they intended to operate the routes that started up in thirty eight, or was it just we're doing our thing, the mail's still the priority? No, that, that's exactly right. It, it didn't really change anything from their point of view. In fact, they knew that the Dutch were going to be competing. Oh, and, and they weren't the only people competing. There are other parts of the route where there are other airlines in competition with Imperial Airways, so it certainly wasn't anything new in that uh, from that point of view. Um, and as far as the Netherlands East Indies to Australia, part of it went. Um, they were knew they knew that uh, the Dutch would be have to be allowed to operate out to Australia as a quid pro quo as part of the deal. So it didn't really change anything they were planning to do. The other side of it is we've got the Japanese as well, who come into our story a lot in a minute. <laughs> But they're also building up networks of of, of civil air travel, um, flying boat services sort of working their way south. So you've got an interesting convergence of imperial 
desires in, in in this region what are the japanese up to besides horrible things in china yeah well that's really one of the big sort of strategic issues of the, the time the, the japanese um they were engaged in a war in china from sort of the mid early to mid 30s uh it didn't go all that well towards uh, the end of the 30s. They were sort of uh, star-mated there a bit. Um, and uh, at the same time, the internal Japanese politics were uh, at play about their future as well. And I'm, I don't pretend to be an expert on any of this, but um, they had a choice essentially between... Uh, they, they, pretty much everyone agreed that they needed to expand their empire because they needed raw materials particularly for... Um, improving, you know, their standards of living at home and so on, and plus all the uh, plus the world sort of power. Um, and so they had a choice between: do we put all our efforts into uh, expanding the war in China, or do we look at expanding down into the South Pacific, uh, South West Pacific? And uh, they had their eye potentially on. The colonial possessions, so the French in Indochina, the British in Malaya, and the Dutch in the Netherlands East Indies, and all of those places had resources that were potentially quite valuable for the Japanese. Um, as well as, or I guess as part of that sort of process of, of working things out, they sought to um, increase the influence in some of the parts of the uh, Southwest Pacific and. One of the places they were looking at was Portuguese Timor. So the island of Timor was divided into two parts. The western half was uh, run by the Dutch um, and the flying boat stopped at Kupang, which was in the Dutch part of the Portuguese Timor to refuel. Um, and the eastern part of Timor was a colony of Portugal. Now, over many years, uh, it had sort of been neglected. It was quite poor. Uh, there wasn't. It wasn't very developed. In fact, it was very underdeveloped, um, and they didn't have much economic activity. They had a bit of coffee exporting and so on, but uh, but you know, they were they were a pretty poor sort of colony. And the Japanese saw that as a bit of an opportunity to get a, a foothold in a strategic position close to Australia and uh, straddling the, the communications for the empire. So they sent a number of people down to Timor, to, plus they were negotiating with the, the Portuguese in um, in Portugal as the sort of colonial masters. Um, but they, they sent some people down to Timor to sort of you know, see what was going on and, and develop uh, you know, relationships and so on in, in Timor. And, of course, the British and Australian governments were not, particularly happy about that because they didn't really want the Japanese sitting on uh, their doorstep, particularly the Australian government. Uh, but the you know, British government was equally concerned. Um, so they were looking at how do we sort of head this off. And um, by 1941, this had all sort of come to a point where we needed to do something to... Um, restrain the Japanese and in fact um, the Australians sent a mission up to uh, Portuguese Timor so they were looking to run an air service into Portuguese Timor and the Portuguese Timorese authorities were keen on the idea of an air service that would connect them into the world's air routes because there was no direct communication by air with Portugal or anywhere else uh, back then uh, and they figured that, you know, an air, air, air service would bring, you know, economic benefits and so on with it. So they wanted to, they actually made approaches to the British authorities to, to talk about, can we run a branch service and so on into um, uh, the Imperial Airways route, but the discussions kind of went nowhere. Um, but by 1941, as I said, things had got to the point where, um, action was needed. So the Australians sent a team up and their um, 
mission was uh, their ostensible mission, I should say, was to uh, negotiate with the Portuguese authorities for landing rights and see what what uh, the aerodrome was like. They had, they had a, an aerodrome in Dili, which was the capital of Portuguese Timor, but it was was pretty underdeveloped uh, at the time. And uh, so they they were supposedly there to negotiate and and find out information about potential air service. In actual fact, one of their secret missions was they were sent up there to find out everything they could about what the Japanese were up to. So it was, was a sort of a spying mission as well as a diplomatic mission. Um, as part of that, uh, so there were actually a couple of trips they did. The first one uh, was the first uh, time an aircraft ever flew out of Australia and to an international destination and back in the same day. Um, so quite an interesting thing. And then there was a later mission where they stayed overnight. In fact, it was uh, between Christmas and New Year. And um, while the Australians were there, the uh, Timorese authorities, the Portuguese Timorese authorities, showed them a model of a flying boat that the Japanese were proposing to use on a service from Japan. So they... They were, they were also seeking permission to operate an air service into Timor as um, part of a plan to, A, allow them to get down to Timor but, and get their people down to Timor, but also to, um, you know, curry favour with the, the Portuguese. Um, and their service came down through the Marianas and uh, down that way to uh, Dili, although their proposed service. And the aircraft they were proposing to use, they gave the Portuguese authorities a model, which they showed to the Australians, and um, they were able to see from the uh, the model of the aircraft that it was, in fact, a converted military aircraft because it had positions for gun turrets and so on, even though it was, it was going to be a civilian operation. Um, so this model, which the Australians had never seen that aircraft before, there was no information about it anyway um, and in fact I think this was the first time anyone in the British Empire had ever had a heads up this was a Kawanishi HAK uh, which became the Mavis flying boat later known as the Mavis by the Allies during the war um, so, but at that point it was a completely unknown type of aircraft and when the Australians came home they photographed this model and uh, they did a bit of looking around and they thought that it might have been a copy of a Sikorsky flying boat because it did have a certain resemblance to it. And, of course, there was a prejudice in those days against uh, the um, ability of the Japanese to do anything on their own. They were thought to be, you know, copiers of other people's work and so on. And so from the Empire point of view, it was easier to attribute the design of this aeroplane to the Americans than it was to the Japanese, because that would have been acknowledging that actually they had a pretty good aircraft industry. And as we know, that uh, prejudice came to bite us on the bum quite severely, not that far in the future. Um, so anyway, the uh, negotiations continued. The Japanese were putting pressure on the Portuguese. So as I said, this is 1941 by this stage. Um, uh, Britain's been knocked out of the war. Hong Kong has been occupied by the Japanese. French Indochina has been occupied by the Japanese. Portuguese had a colony up near Hong Kong on the island of Macau. The Portuguese were neutral, of course, during the war. Um, but the Japanese put a lot of pressure on Portugal over Macau as part of the pressure to let them start up this air service down to Timor. Uh, so the Portuguese government uh, acquiesced um, somewhat, I think, against their their real wishes, but but they went along with it. And at the same time, they also uh, are much happier to allow uh, the British Empire to run an air service through uh, Timor as well. So we ended up with a sort of competing thing. The Japanese were given approval to run, I think it was eight proving flights, which they did over 1941, 
um, whereas the, the British service was implemented by making it a diversion of the, the corner service, uh, which, as I said, went through Kuping and uh, Dutch Timor. But every fortnight they diverted it, so it went through Dili instead of uh, Kuping. Um, so one direction one week and the other direction the next week. So it's quite an interesting saga that went on behind the scenes with all of that as well, because as I said, the Australian government was really quite worried about what the Japanese were up to. And so as part of this uh, setting up of this uh, diversion on the Qantas air service, they sent some Department of Civil Aviation people up there um, initially to set up an air radio station because there was there was really no communications or navigation aids in Portuguese Timor. So we took some radio gear up from Australia and set it up. Um, and the radio operator, they had a commercial radio station which they used for telegrams and that sort of thing. And the radio operator there was a chap by the name of Patricio de Luz. And he was actually Chinese, of Chinese descent. And uh, he hated the Japanese because of what they were doing in China. So he was quite happy to work with the Australians and they set up this air radio station. And they actually were using that radio station as a uh, secret communications channel because they were hooked into the air radio network back to Australia. So <clears throat> the Portuguese had a requirement that if you sent a telegram out of Timor, it had to be in plain language and it could only be in certain languages that they could read. Um, so any reports, for example, from the Japanese back to Japan using telegrams had to be in basically plain language, so they couldn't send anything by code. But the Australians were able to send messages back to Australia using the air radio network completely confidentially. So <laughs> it was a real spy set up. And uh, after we set up the air radio station, they set up a champ um, to uh, be a man on the ground there whose name was Dave Ross. Dave Ross was a pretty interesting fellow. He'd been an RAAF pilot uh, in the 20s and 30s. He was a flying boat expert. He'd uh, done a lot of survey work using uh, flying boats, particularly up on the Great Barrier Reef in Queensland. And then later on joined the Civil Aviation Branch as the superintendent of flying, which was kind of head of everything to do with flying operations in the CAB. And uh, when they were looking for someone to go up and be our man on the ground in Timor, they fingered Dave Ross, and he was actually a pretty good choice. He'd, he'd also done an experimental flight prior to the start of the air service in 1934. He flew a one of the department's gypsy moths, would you believe, up to up to Timor to suss out the aerodrome conditions and so on. But that was Dutch team, of course. But, you know, he had been to Timor, so he knew the area. And uh, also, as I said, he was a flying boat expert. So they sent him up to Dutch Timor, posing as a, uh, a control officer, which was like the air, sort of air traffic control, come manager, come whatever of the... Uh, the flying boat base, which really didn't amount to much, but the man that did Dave Ross in a boat, pretty much. Um, but his real job, once again, was spying on what the Japanese were up to. He was up there to gather intelligence. And uh, Ross wasn't all that happy about it. Um, he didn't really want to go. Uh, he sort of agreed reluctantly to head on up there. And then... Uh, spent a fair bit of his time riding back home saying, please, can I come home? But um, as tensions increased, because uh, this was all right in the lead up to Pearl Harbor, um, and not to mention the Japanese invasions of Malaya and Netherlands East Indies. Uh, so politically, things were getting really tense with Japan and his position in Timor was needed more than ever because we didn't want the Japanese suddenly popping up out of Timor right on our doorstep if war broke out. Um, so Dave Ross stayed in Timor and, and the um, 
Japanese put pressure on the Portuguese authorities to allow them to appoint a consul. And, of course, then we had to match that. So Dave Ross was made the consul, much to his disgust. Anyway, poor old Dave Ross was still in Portuguese Timor when the Japanese invaded in February of 1942. And he was captured. Uh, there wasn't much of a defence put up. Oh, actually, there was, there was another part of the story prior to that. Earlier on, so after the start of the Pacific War, after 7th of December 1941, or 8th of December if you live in our part of the world, but before the early 42 Japanese invasion, Australia had sent troops up to Dutch Timor to reinforce the Dutch forces up there because we were getting a bit worried. And of course, it didn't take long for the Japanese invasions of the Southwest Pacific to reach that part of the world. And uh, we also thought that Portuguese Timor, having no military force of any significance and a Japanese presence, which we knew about, uh, looked pretty ripe for the Japanese to pluck. So we wanted to head that off. So the Australian and Dutch authorities, um, I'll say conspired, to, because remember, Portuguese uh, Portugal was neutral. Um, they conspired to plan an invasion of Portuguese Timor, and Dave Ross was instrumental in that. Um, he they had by this time set up a, an air service linking Dili and Kupang in Timor. Ross took the, the aeroplane across to Kupang, where the, and he met with the Dutch and Australian military commanders and flew back to uh, Dili the next day and basically delivered an ultimatum to the governor of Portuguese Timor saying, we're going to invade, uh, let us do it or there'll be bloodshed, basically. Um, so the Portuguese Timorese authorities were not at all impressed. As I said, they were supposedly neutral, but you know, there wasn't much they could do about it, and so Dutch and Australian troops occupied Portuguese Timor. So when the Japanese did invade in February of 42, Ross was captured. The Dutch and Australian troops, such as they were, didn't put up that much of a fight, and they took off up into the, the hills. And over the next few weeks and months, they mounted a bit of a guerrilla campaign against the Japanese. So the Japanese more or less were contained, not contained, they were, they contained themselves in the coastal area and uh, particularly in Dili and the Australians were able to come down out of the hills and mount nuisance raids and so on. And one of the things they actually did was they did a raid on the post office and pinched the radios from the post office and took them back up into the mountains and then they were able to use those radios to communicate back to Australia and say, hey, we're still here. Um, we're hiding up in the mountains. Just before we get into detail of, of, of what's happening in in Timor and the like, this is all happening terribly quickly. But before we go a bit further, I was just wondering, because it's been two years now since the routes to London have been severed. What's happening with the stuff heading west as well? Because I, I, I know what's I know what's coming and it's it's fascinating. But before we get to the fun bit, let's let's just do the boring the boring <laughs> stuff back to back to Europe and then we can we can forget about Europe. Right. Well we sort of did jump ahead a long way, of course, uh, by going into the Portuguese Timor story, which was, was a bit of a side issue in the, in the whole thing, but it is a absolutely fascinating story. That is fascinating. I definitely wanted to talk to you about it. So this this is great. But for those people of a European bent, you know. <laughs> Me, <laughs> yeah. That because because that it's not a case of just stopping, is it? It's changing things up a bit and and making sure the operation can continue as best as possible. Yeah. Well, if we go back to the start of the, well, what we in the, I suppose the British part of the world, and I I can't Australia in that from this point of view, uh, what we think of as the start of the war, which was September thirty nine. So the Empire Airmail scheme that. By the time we, we put stage three into effect, which was the Australian part of it, which came in into operation in August of 1938, that really only ran. So all of that effort, the scheme really only ran for a year. And then the Second World War started and it all 
terminated. So, um, it, yeah, it was a bit disappointing. <laughs> they put all that work in and, and really never got that far. But anyway, um, in September 1939, of course, the Second World War is declared. Australia declares war along with Britain. And part of the deal with the... Oh, oh sorry. First of all, initially the, the air service, the Empire Air Mail Scheme part of it... Or, is, is terminated, so they put a surcharge back on the mail to reduce the um, amount of mail flying uh, by making it more expensive. And services are reduced because some of the aeroplanes get uh, taken up by the military forces. So in, in the UK, the RAF, uh, short of aeroplanes like everybody else, um, took some of the Imperial Airways fleet uh, out of service. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, among our collection of kamikaze aircraft. Um, we have two versions of the Oka, which was a suicide rocket-powered human-guided bomb. This version here is the two-seat trainer version. We made a couple of them that were... Uh, launched on a catapult with one rocket engine that they would use to train uh, potential OCA pilots. Um, we have the instructor in the back and the student up front. It technically could glide and they could land it back on the skid and, you know, learn how to fly the operational version of the aircraft. It also had a longer wingspan to allow it to uh, perform as a glider. The operational OCA right over here, um, which is on loan from the Royal Air Force Museum. Um, the trainer version is actually on loan from the National Air and Space Museum. The operational OCA was an anti-shipping, human-guided suicide bomb. It would be loaded underneath a Japanese T4M Betty bomber. Um, it would be launched, had four, you know, three rockets in the back, if I recall correctly, and really only had about less than a minute only maybe about, it was about 20 or 30 seconds worth of uh, actual flight time. And then it would kind of go into a terminal dive on, on a ship guided by the suicide or kamikaze pilot flying the aircraft. They weren't all that successful, um, not because of the design itself. The biggest problem being the fact that they were strapped on a Japanese Betty. They had to get within about 20 miles of the American fleet which meant most of them were shot down while still strapped on the Japanese bomber. Um, but they did have a few successes uh, off of Okinawa. So the aircraft behind it is a Nakajima Ki-115 Tsurugi, which is another purpose-built kamikaze aircraft. During the war, the majority of kamikaze aircraft leading up to you know, the end of the war were mostly repurposed aircraft, so Zeros, Oscars, Bettys, Bells, etc. Um, with the Sarugi, the Japanese Army Air Service was building an aircraft specifically designed from bottom up as a one-way mission kamikaze suicide special attack force aircraft. Um, the wings are made out of aluminum. The fuselage is essentially made out of metal that's no different than you'd have in air ducting. That's why it's kind of rusted. The inside of the cockpit is all very rudimentary with like wooden made out of wood wood control stick and throttle maybe three or four gauges at best um, the landing gear actually dropped off the aircraft so that they could repurpose them also you know it kind of forced i will say it probably also forced the japanese pilot onto his to complete his mission or attempt to complete his mission so once you uh, drop the landing gear the explosive or bomb that's armed underneath your aircraft you're not exactly going to be able to belly land that aircraft without uh, destroying yourself in the aircraft but this was kind of shows just like how desperate the Japanese were getting at the end of the war, just making these mass produced um, s kind of like simple built aircraft um, just so they could have the sheer numbers for them for the uh, what they expected to be the decisive invasion of Japan uh, with the uh, first in Kyushu and then Honshu. But because of the dropping of the atomic bombs in Hirohito, realizing that they could not go on any longer that they decided to surrender to the United States, or in the Allies, I should say. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.com.
www.ghostbusters.org. And now, back to the show. One, one thing to jump in here, I, I think, because you, you mentioned <coughs> the RF rec, 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 I was just saying that earlier, requisitioning um, the Empire of Boats. Some people think that the, the Sunderland is just a militarized version of this C class boat. It's not, is it? It's quite a different no. beast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Sunderland looks very similar. And obviously, it has a family lineage that includes the Empire Flying Bats. It's certainly for sure a lot of its features are very similar, but it was, in fact, a completely different, larger aircraft. The, for example, the Empire Flying Bats at their start had a maximum takeoff weight of 43,500 pounds, and the Sunderland's had a max takeoff weight of 58,000 and something pounds. So they're, they're a, a much heavier, larger aircraft, even though they look similar. Okay, no, I, I just wanted to, to make that point because I have seen on the interwebs the, the debate that it's, it, yeah. They stuck a couple of turrets on a C class and, and got the yeah. Sunderland, but it was not not the not the case at all. In Britain, some of the uh, Empire flying bats that got requisitioned did actually have turrets fitted, so it just kind of has to confuse <laughs> the subject even more. But yeah, the, the Sunderland and the Empire bats were two different things. Cool. So back to the roots. Sorry. Okay. So as I mentioned in part one. When the Australian government acquiesced to joining the Empire ML scheme, uh, the agreement that they came up with was that Qantas would own six of the flying boats. And as I, I mentioned, the reason for that was that the Australian government wanted, if there was a war, to be able to call on those six aeroplanes uh, for its own use. And that's exactly what happened. So when the Second World War was declared, uh, a couple of weeks later, the uh, Australian Air Force, um, people like to say impressed or requisition or whatever, but they, they're actually chartered, would you believe? So they chartered two flying boats, but the two flying boats that they chartered happened to be two Imperial Airways flying boats that were in Rose Bay at the time. So even though we nominally had our six flying boats, they didn't want to wait for those aeroplanes to come back to Sydney. They just grabbed the two that were in Rose Bay at the time and things were pretty desperate uh, because the Royal Australian Air Force had no modern aircraft. The, the most modern aircraft they had was the Avro Anson in 1939 and that doesn't say a lot. So they needed desperately needed some long-range patrol aircraft and uh, they chartered some DC-2s and 3s, or not sure about 2s, but 3s anyway from Australian National Airways. but. Uh, the Qantas Empire boats were part of the deal that they would be available in time of war. So they took on those two Imperial Airways boats, um, Centaurus and Calypso, they were, uh, and they were converted at Rose Bay with some military features. So they, all the cabin furnishings were stripped out. Uh, they were fitted with bomb racks and uh, some primitive gun emplacements. And they were allocated to 11 Squadron, RFIF, and uh, as soon as they were converted, they were sent up to New Guinea and they were used, uh, based in Port Moresby. Uh, 11 Squadron had two Empire boats and a few Seagulls at that time, and they were used to, the Empire boats, and well, I guess, and the Seagulls were used for reconnaissance in uh, or around New Guinea, but also in the Solomon Islands and... Um, uh, New Britain, that sort of area. So we were obviously keen to see if the Japanese were coming our way at that point. Um, or uh, the other thing they were looking for too was, was German raiders, which um, they'd had some experience out here with German raiders during the First World War, and uh, they were worried that commerce raiders would come out to um, our waters and, and sink uh, you know, Allied ships. Uh, if... Just to jump in again, if, dear listener, yeah. you want to learn more about First World War German commerce raiders in the Pacific, see my friend Chris Sams. He will bore you to tears on the subject. But uh, 
very interesting. You get Turpitz the pig and and all and all those people pop popping up. And yes, yeah, so if you ever walk around the Imperial War Museum and see the head of a pig on a wall, it goes straight back to German commerce raiders and in the Pacific. Anyways, sorry, Phil, off you off yeah. you go. No, not at all. Well, the Germans did send commerce raiders out to our part of the world, well, ours being Australia. Um, during the Second World War as well. And, of course, the cruiser Sydney was famously sunk off Western Australia by the Cormoran, which was a, a commerce raider. Um, so, anyway, uh, yeah, the two Empire didn't flying boats were... They they found Sydney the other year, didn't they? Or have they always... Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. So that was a pretty good feat of detective work, I think. Long mm. time people were looking for it. Uh, anyway, back to the empires. They let, were, let, the yeah, we're, 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 gonna, we're talking about flying boats, not not <laughs> boats proper. Come on, <laughs> no, that's right, not sinking boats. Uh, we're going to get some sinking flying boats later. Uh, well, we'll, 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 we'll get to a few of those. Um, uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> Throw me off completely now. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's all right. They, they were the Air Forces, the Royal Australian Air Forces, most modern aeroplane. Oh, they actually had a squadron of Sunderlands uh, as well, but they were in the UK training when the war was declared and the Australian government agreed to leave them in the UK for military use over there. So we had no uh, modern aircraft in Australia, but we did have Sunderlands uh, in service, but they were in the UK. Um, so uh, about six months later, the Air Force chartered another two of the Empire flying boats. So remember, these are coming out of the, the fleet of aircraft that are available to operate the passenger service. Right? So in June of 1940, we got another two. But this time, they waited till the Australian boats were in Sydney before they nabbed them. So this time, we got uh, Coogee and Coolangatta, which were the two there. And they were allocated, those four boats, they were allocated hard of their serials, a eighteen ten through to um, thirteen. Um, they were also converted, and they were sent up to New Guinea as well uh, for use by Eleven Squadron. So, in the meantime, because the fleet had been de- depleted, both by the F, the Royal Australian Air Force taking some of the aircraft, and by the Royal Air Force taking some of the aircraft, the services on the Empire Air Route had to be reduced. But they were still operating on the same route as before. However, that all have changed in um, July of 1940 when the Germans invaded France. So the air route from Britain came down from Southampton through France uh, and then across the Mediterranean, down, uh, down to Marseille and then across to uh, Italy and across the Mediterranean that way. Uh, so the Germans invaded France. The um, air route was still able to continue for a while, but uh, towards the, or uh, after a, a few weeks, um, Mussolini wanted to get in on the action before it was too late. And so he also declared war on uh, Britain and France, and they mounted the invasion of the southern part of France. And the big problem for Imperial Airways, which had become BOAC by this time. They had a, an amalgamation between Imperial Airways and British Airways, uh, the old British Airways, and became BOAC, British Overseas Airways Corporation. Um, the problem for BOAC was that the Italians really controlled the Mediterranean um, to an extent. And, of course, they couldn't fly through Italy uh, at that point. Now... They had some plans in place and they were able to deal with it. I actually wrote an article about this a while ago. Um, they had a thing called a war book and it was their plans for what would happen if um, a war started and, and it detailed how they were going to manage all the aircraft, which is what they did. So basically the ones that were uh, Malta and west of Malta all went back to the UK and the ones that were east of Malta went through to Egypt. So we had a hole in the route at that point. Um, you had a bunch of aeroplanes in the UK, and then there were a bunch of aeroplanes in Egypt and east of Egypt. 
So are they based out of Alexandria, are they, or or elsewhere? Uh, yeah, Alexandria is the base, that's right. Mm. Yep. So the IAC reacted pretty quickly to all of this, and they realised, obviously, the Mediterranean and France were all cut off, and the you know, Germans didn't take long to punch their way through France. So Britain was effectively cut off from its empire, or by air anyway. So BOAC uh, reacted pretty quickly. They uh, were able to send some aircraft down to uh, South Africa via the uh, west coast of Africa and um, some people and so on by ship, and they set up a base in Durban in South Africa. And that became the, the BIAC main operating base for the next, well, really, till the end of the war. So along with that, what you ended up with was the new base in Durban at the southern part of Africa, and you had Sydney as the terminus of the, the route in Asia, and the route that they were able to run ran up through Africa to Egypt, and then across from Egypt through the Middle East out to uh, India, Malaya, and then down to Australia, which forms a sort of big arc, if you look at it on a map, and that became known as the Horseshoe Route. So the, the, the Horseshoe Route was the, uh, for the first part of the war, was the way the, the whole uh, flying bird service operated, and that was how Britain maintained communications throughout the empire. So mail from anywhere uh, in Africa or Middle East, India and so on, would go to Durban, be put on a ship, sail in a convoy up to Britain, uh, and in the reverse, mail from Britain would go out by ship to Durban and then on the flying boat and around the empire that way. So it was obviously a, a pretty big impact on, on the services, but they were able to, to keep the service going um, pretty well. And, of course, uh, as time went by, there were things like, uh, you know, we had a lot of troops in the, the Middle East. When I say we, I mean the British Empire. And uh, they had a lot of mail going to and from troops and so on, and that all went on the, the flying boat service. Great. So we've... So that was... We can, we can, we yeah. can go back to the Pacific now. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was the way things were until the end of 1941. And remember, we talked about the Timor diversion as uh, happening during that period, started off during the Horseshoe Route period. In... Uh, Late 1941, BOAC were, were starting to be squeezed for crews because they, they had a lot of commitments and uh, pilots had been called up and so on. In fact, Qantas were in the same boat uh, as well as the aeroplanes being chartered by the Air Force. Part of the deal for the Australian end of the scheme was that, and, and the contract between Qantas and the Australian government was that the crews of the aircraft would be enlisted in the RAAF Reserve with the same objective that if war broke out, they could be called up. And when the flying boats were chartered, that's exactly what the Air Force did. They called up a bunch of the crews and they sent them off to 11 Squadron up in New Guinea. So they're, they're actually manned by Qantas aeroplanes being flown by Qantas crews, but in RAAF uh, uniform and markings. And in fact, there's some interesting correspondence I came across uh, Qantas didn't want any non-Qantas crews flying the Empire flying boats. They were very protective of their aircraft and they only wanted their own people uh, to fly them. So it's quite interesting. Um, anyway, that's <laughs> by the by. Uh, so in, in late 1941, BOAC was running out of crews and they asked Qantas, could you extend your part of the route from Singapore up to Karachi, which Karachi is in Pakistan now, but it, in those days it was India. And Karachi was kind of the main terminus in India. It wasn't the terminus of the route, but it was the main sort of uh, place in India where other routes connected in and where a lot of the activity went on. Um, so Qantas actually approached the Australian Air Force and got some of their crews back, and then they, they were able to take on that responsibility. So by the end of 1941, Qantas was operating all the way through to Karachi, and then the crews would swap again, but the flying boats would go all the way to Durban and so on, as, as previously. 
by the end of 1941, as I mentioned, tensions were increasing with the Japanese and people could see that war was coming over the horizon, whether we really wanted it or not. Well, it wasn't by any means certain, but you know, highly likely. So um, the Australian authorities, in, in conjunction with the British, then looked at some planning for what would happen if there was a war. And of course, remember that we thought Singapore was the impregnable fortress that, uh, you know, didn't matter what the Japanese did, Singapore would never fall and uh, blah, blah, blah. So um, this was kind of contingency planning, but not really, I guess, completely expected to have to be used. But uh, we sent a, one of the Qantas pilots off with uh, Orm Denny. He did a trip with the Dutch Marine Air Force, who also operated flying boats, uh, Dornier 24s, um, in the Netherlands East Indies. And so I remember the Netherlands have been occupied now, but the Dutch East Indies continued as its own colony. They didn't surrender with the, um, the mainland, the homeland, I should say. And so the armed forces, the Dutch armed forces in, in the Netherlands East Indies still continued as a kind of, uh, or under Dutch, I'm going to say remote control, that's not what I mean. Uh, Gov- government in uh, exile. And, government yeah. in exile, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So under the control of the government in exile. So Orm Denny went off with uh, some people from the Dutch um, Marine Air Force and they did a tour of uh, ports throughout the Netherlands East Indies. So the air route previously had come down from uh, Burma down the uh, west coast of Malaya, as it was then, to Singapore, and then across from Singapore to Batavia, which was the capital of the Dutch East Indies. And, oh, actually, sorry, before that, uh, it came from Burma to Thailand to Bangkok, and then from Bangkok down to uh, Malaya. Um, So they explored some alternative routes down the west coast of Sumatra, which would put the air route much further to the west of what they thought the Japanese might be able to achieve and also would put, you know, the high ground of Sumatra itself between the air route and, and, and the Japanese. So they had some plans developed before the war started and they they phased, they had a, um, a series of phases that they'd set up so that depending on what happened, they could implement part of, uh, of this plan. Um, they also looked at alternative routes down through the Andaman Islands, which are sort of west of uh, Malaya and, and uh, Burma as well as a diversion. So they did have some ideas, but when things went really bad on the 7th of December or 8th of December, 1941, as we mentioned before, the Japanese punched down. They very quickly overran uh Thailand and so Bangkok obviously became untenable as a stopping place very early on and then they quickly punched down through uh, Malaya as well much much quicker than anyone had ever thought was possible. So very quickly on they were faced with implementing these diversion routes so uh, Bangkok was bypassed uh, quite soon um, and then uh, various other parts of the diversion were put in as, as the Japanese advance sort of steamrolled down through the Dutch East Indies. Um, Singapore became untenable fairly quickly, so they had to um, stop services going through Singapore, so the services went round Sumatra to Batavia, um, and they ran a branch service for a few weeks going from Batavia into Singapore. So they basically were taking military people in and, and civilians out. So that's another thing. We haven't really talked about who was flying on the flying boats at this brief period, but obviously they were quite different passengers than pre-war. That's all we have time for this week. But next week, we're going to pick up exactly where we left off because we're going to see the war in the Pacific reach Australia with the bombings of Darwin and Broome. And we're going to look into the specifics of the loss of the C-class flying boat Circe, which Phil did some incredible research to discover exactly what happened to that boat, her crew and her passengers. As always, I'd like to say thank you to the Pima Air and Space Museum for their continued sponsorship of the podcast. And of course, to you, dear listener, for your support by tuning in 
And of course, telling all your friends, popping stars into your podcast app of choice. It does the world of good to the algorithms. Hello to our AI overlords. And if you want, of course, you can join us as a Damcastier over on Patreon, where you'll get episodes like this in one massive chunk, nice and early, no having to wait for next week. It's all there for you, including some fantastic little videos that we're putting together with the Pima team, which normally go into the mid-rolls of these podcasts. We actually do film that stuff, and they're going up on YouTube and things, but you get to see them all first as soon as I get them on the Patreon. So that starts from three pounds a month plus a bit of that. You get a thank you card for me, but don't worry about it. Tell your friends. Numbers are going up. More people are joining us every day to find out some great history for some great aviation historians and enthusiasts. So until next week, when we continue on the story of the C-Class boats at war, please do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.